against physical foes but against the one Song like that makes you want to fall out on the street and start swinging at people, doesn't it? Man, that's a great song. I love it. I love it. 
Welcome to our worship service day. It's so good to see you here. We had a uh, celebratory moment today when the young married couple Sunday school class overflowed their big room upstairs and had to come down and take over our sanctuary. Hallelujah. That's great. Next week, they'll be going down to the fellowship hall. I kind of had that set aside today thinking there'd be some newcomers come for orientation, which did not happen, but it was there with food and drink, all that stuff going with it. But anyway, next Sunday morning, the young married class will meet downstairs. You'll tell them all about that next week, right? It's going to be divided into two groups so you have more time to talk, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's uh, an exciting thing. Hallelujah. We, we love it when we outgrow stuff. That's great. And uh, thank you so much for making that happen. If you're a first-time guest here today, we certainly hope that when you came in, you were greeted warmly and you were given a little flyer about our church with a visitor's card attached. We'd like you to fill out that visitor's card and give us as much of the local information as you know right now and drop that in the offering plate when it comes by and take that little flyer and read about all the things we do here at our church. You get to know a whole lot more about us through that and we appreciate that very, very much. Thank you for being here. Immediately following the worship service is going to be a, uh, our bi-monthly church council meeting and a new idea has sprung up. So if you're on the church council, I need you to respond to this following question. Would you rather go down in the, sanct in the fellowship hall and have pizza in a council meeting or would you rather go out to a restaurant and have a council meeting? Downstairs with pizza. That many, that many wants to go downstairs. One, two, three, four. I see five hands. Out to a restaurant with... I think downstairs one, guys. I don't know. We'll talk more about it at the council meeting down in the fellowship hall immediately following <laughs> our worship service. And uh, I'll be out ordering pizzas while you all are singing. So uh, that's immediately following uh, our church, church service. Uh, Naomi Ornella sitting right over here. Uh, well, somewhere over there. Well, all her kids sitting over there. Uh, they're moving. Uh, they're moving from Sachilia to Aviano so she can be closer to uh, our church here closer to the place where she has a ministry distributing food and clothing to uh, underprivileged people. Uh, that move is going to take place on March 21 and 22, and she has sent out an appeal for help. Some people are already lining up. Uh, we have a truck already uh, volunteered and a driver, all that stuff. But if you would like to volunteer to help move, now here's the thing. Her husband is downrange. He's deployed. His picture's on the prayer board over there. She is with child again, and uh, so she needs help. She needs some uh, ladies who have skill at packing and getting stuff ready to move without breaking it, and she'll need some men uh, to help load and unload some stuff. So guys, uh, ladies, all of you, just uh, heed that, and the days are March 21, 22. Uh, I actually think that's a Saturday and a Sunday, so <laughs> uh, do as much work as you can on Saturday, okay? We want you here on Sunday. But anyway... Uh, see Naomi and tell her you're willing to help and let's make sure she has all the manpower and woman power she needs to get this move uh, organized. In your bulletin today, you have all the information about the uh, International Baptist Convention's Global Mission Offering. This is something they did in most of our churches back in December and January. We're doing it just now because I was gone for a, a very long period of time there. This is a mission offering, and it shows you on that flyer where all the money goes, how it's divided up. And I was part of the committee that set that thing up that way. Uh, please notice that a significant part of it goes to plant new churches. We have a goal in the International Baptist Convention to have an English-speaking Baptist church in every European city that has any sizable population of English-speaking people. Uh, I hope church is such a blessing to you that you have some compassion in your heart for people who get stuck in European cities with no real church to go to, uh, you can help remedy that by giving generously to the global mission offering. So there's your opportunity for that. There's also a flyer about a women's retreat going to take place in Prague uh, in April. Uh, let's see, Wednesday, I suppose, is the final day to, uh, to uh, register and get the discounted rate. Now, Prague, more than likely, is the most beautiful city in all of Europe. Adelia and I, several years ago, were in Warsaw, and there was a woman there in the church we were serving that had, she was a very well-traveled, she was from the United Kingdom, but she traveled all over Europe. She said, yeah, it's either Prague or Paris. Right now, I think Prague's the most beautiful city. I've got to go back and give Paris one more chance. 
but we have it on, and we've seen it, and we think it's the most beautiful city. So if you've never been to Prague, here's a great chance for you to go have a lot of good spiritual nourishment while you're there because the women's retreats are always well uh, tended and, and well uh, led, great teachers and that kind of thing. Get a chance to meet Christian women from all over Europe. Uh, so that's in there for your benefit if you want to take advantage of it. Now, here today, it's high time we make some plans about Easter Sunday. The church council meeting is coming up right after this. We have uh, reserved Area D from 8 o'clock Easter Sunday morning until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. The chapel has it immediately after we do. Um, we talked last week about how would it work for you if we did everything about an hour earlier. And now the fact that we, uh, on, on the books anyway, we're supposed to give up the place at 1 o'clock on Easter Sunday. How would it work for you if we did our worship service here at 10 o'clock so we get through early, get over there, have a picnic, Easter egg hunt, and be ready to leave by 1 o'clock? Uh, would, would everybody go along with that? That's what we want to know. Hands up. If, I have a yes. That's changed. It changed on the 27th of February. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, that has changed. Just. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Wing Chaplain knew first, and they got there before we did, so they got the afternoon hours on Easter Sunday, but we got the morning. And, uh, and you know, they may not care if we overrun our time and hang around with them. We don't know that yet. I can ask that question tomorrow when they're back in their office. But here's my thinking. You know, we try to have a an S-O-N sunrise service at 8 o'clock up at the Chrome Dome. This year Easter's coming early. I don't know if it's going to be good weather or what. Uh, last year was, I think, the only time we've ever rained out or something. But maybe we just forget about the sunrise service, just come together at uh, 9 o'clock, let's say, for Sunday school and 10 o'clock for worship service and go straight over to Area D. Uh, we'll have a potluck picnic and uh, have an Easter egg hunt for our children, and we'll just celebrate Easter together. Uh, does that, does that, will anybody feel like you missed something important if we don't do a 8 o'clock sunrise service? Okay, let's make that our schedule then. And uh, we still have time to make adjustments if we need to, but 9 o'clock Bible study on Easter Sunday, 10 o'clock worship service. Get out of here as quickly as we can. Uh, that, we, we'll, we will have the Lord's Supper that day, of course. It's the first Sunday of our month, uh, so we'll have Lord's Supper. Okay. We have a nominating committee that's up and running and going full board trying to fill all the different ministry and committee positions in our church. And we're handicapped by a couple of important things. One is that most of our leadership positions in church require people to be members of our church. That's in the church bylaws, been here ever since the church has existed. And we have so many wonderful people coming to church here now who are not yet church members. So we're kind of handicapped by being able to ask you to help or allow you to help. And we'd really like you to be seriously praying about the issue of church membership. Here's what that means. You just come and tell us you've been saved. You're a born-again child of God. You can tell us the incident when it happened. You were baptized, immersed in water uh, as, a, as an act of obedience, not a requirement for your salvation. Uh, after you became a believer and uh, the way the Bible teaches and uh, if you have a church membership somewhere back in the States where mom and dad and grandma and grandpa have their membership, you don't want to move it. We'll take you in on statement of faith. You can be a member of two churches for the period that you're here. That, that means when they start counting beans, you're going to get counted twice, but that doesn't matter. Uh, God knows you're only one person. But we, we also encourage people, go ahead and transfer your membership. It's not terminal. You can transfer it back once you leave here. It's not one of those things, once we get it, we hold on to it forever. We'll give it back to you. So be prayerfully considering church membership here. If you're going to be attending our worship services and you agree with the doctrines and things we teach, please prayerfully consider becoming a church member so you can be part. This ministry is growing. It's getting more and more exciting all the time. We have things going on, uh, just wonderful, exciting things. We need help. We encourage you to make that decision. Okay, um, right now, we're going to ask you to stand and greet one another. And then after that, we'll go back to our song service and... So greet each other in Jesus' name. Make everybody feel welcome at Aviano Baptist Church.
sing this as, as you return to your seat. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Wait. Strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We wait. A little bit louder. Strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will sing that with us one more time. Strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will. Our God, you reign forever. Our God, you reign forever. Our Lord, our strong King.
Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome. Sing that again. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome. Sing this with me. Humble thyself. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher. And he shall lift you up. Let's sing that again. Humble thyself. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up a higher and higher, and He shall lift you up. When He rolls up His sleeves, He ain't just putting on the ritz. There's thunder in His footsteps and lightning in His fist. In the Lord, he wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, and you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome Our God, our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And He shall lift you up. The sky was starless in the void of the night. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Judgment and wrath, he poured out on Sodom. A mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God. Thyself in the sight of the Lord. I humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up a higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. And he shall lift you up a higher and higher. We're going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time to collect the morning offering. If you'll just remain standing with us, we're going to continue to worship.
is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Holy. Are you Lord God Almighty? Worthy is the Lamb. Children's Church can be dismissed at this time if the children are still here. Age three through kindergarten can go upstairs. Age three through kindergarten. Those of us who are still seated, let's join our hearts together in prayer before we go into the word of God this morning. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are indeed an awesome God so very worthy of our worship and praise, of our learning, of our obeying. You're so worthy of everything that we have, everything that we are. Lord, you're worthy of all of it. This morning, Lord, we gather here worshiping you, and through the week, Lord, we've been living in worship of you. We just thank you for being who you are and for your grace and mercy that lets us be who we are in Jesus Christ. We thank you for him, your unspeakable gift your gift that can never be measured. We thank you for Jesus and all that we have in him. 
Lord, we're so thankful for the Bible, this miraculous word, miraculous because it has survived down through all the centuries of violent opposition, efforts to destroy it. It survives. It's miraculous because it can touch our hearts and change our lives. We thank you for that. We're so thankful we have the opportunity to open that up this morning and see what you have for us. And I'm so thankful, Lord, for the message that flows from the word today. I can give it in all confidence knowing that I'm expressing your heart toward your people. And I thank you so much for that confidence. Father, we're so thrilled that our young adults, uh, young married couples class overflowed their room today and had to move out. We, uh, we're so thankful for the other Sunday school classes taking place. We're thankful always, Lord, when people present themselves in church with a hunger to know your word. And we just pray you'll help all of us hunger more deeply, seek uh, more energetically to know your word better. And then not only, Lord, to know it, but to apply it, let it work in our hearts and lives, as I said earlier, to change us, to make us more like what you want us to be. We just ask you, Lord, to take these next few minutes, have your way in our lives. Let us just open ourselves before you, receive what you have for us, and then benefit from it in the way that you intend for us to benefit. Thank you for your great love toward us. In Jesus' name, amen. You were going through life, footloose and fancy free, scarcely a care in the world, and then you met somebody and you fell in love, and you got married. And you're still pretty much foot loose and fancy free. You're just two young people loving each other and living life and everything's good. And, and all of a sudden, baby time. And oh, what a joy it is. Here comes this precious little creature into life, a fulfillment of your love for one another and, and what a joy. But as you start looking at that little baby, you begin to get this sense of foreboding. There is a burden that goes with having a child. As much joy as they bring, as much as happiness as we get from them, as much as we love them, there is a burden. Now we've got to provide for them. We've got to take care of them all the days of their youth and infancy and youth and on up into adulthood. We've got to prepare them for life in a, a cruel and dangerous world. There comes a burden with having children, doesn't it? Doesn't there? So it is with God our Father. He is so happy to have a sinner come out of their sin, repent, Trust Jesus Christ, be born again into his family to become one of the sheep in his flock. He loves that. It makes him very, very happy. But also it brings a burden because he has a responsibility toward us to nurture us through all the days of our walk here on earth until he gets us home where he wants, to be, wants us to be. We're going to see in 1 Peter chapter 5, there's one of the passages that I think talks very much about the burden of the great shepherd toward us, his sheep. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, reading through verse 11. You can follow in your own Bible or on the screen, whichever suits you best. 1 Peter chapter 5. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect Establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Lord, please add your blessing to the reading and preaching of your word. You and I have a God in heaven, a Father, an eternal heavenly Father, an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent Father who loves us with all his being. The Bible tells us God is love, and that love is directed toward you and me. And as he looks down upon us struggling through this walk from here to eternity, he has a burden for our well-being. He cares about us. He wants his best for us at all times. And he has a burden that you and I experience his best, that we walk through this world unscathed by all the things around us that can bring harm to us. He has a burden. 
And in this passage, he expresses that burden in various ways. Now, I just want you to follow along as I uh, go through this. I, I really was torn about trying to turn this into two sermons. And I, Anyway, let's see what happens, okay? If we look at verses 1 through 4, I'm going to use some words, just some simple little words, hope, hopefully help you to remember this as you look at this passage in the, in the future. The burden of the great shepherd for our input. Our great shepherd cares about what goes into us as his sheep, as his children. You care about what your children eat, do you not? I hope so. Uh, I hope you haven't let the fast food craze and the convenience of nuke it and puke it, what are, you know, that stuff. Uh, get it. I hope you feed your children well because you should have a concern, a burden for what goes into their little bodies, into their systems, into their lives. You should be concerned about the intellectual input as well. God is concerned about all those things. He's concerned about what goes into our system as his children. He wants us to have healthy, life-giving, invigorating food, not something that's going to slow us down, harm us, and hurt us. He cares about what we're fed. He cares about what kind of people feed us. And he cares about what they receive as a result of feeding us. He says here, he, first, he gives in verse 1 a, a motivation, a motivation. The elders, and he uses a Greek word presbyteros. It's the word from which the uh, denomination Presbyterian gets this foundation. Presbyteros, the elders. It can, mean, it can mean just an old person or it can mean somebody who's appointed to the pastoral role in a church. Who are among you, I exhort, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He's giving them a motivation. He's giving them a motivation to do something. I am one of you. I, Peter, who write this uh, epistle to you. I am one of you, so I'm writing to you from a common ground, a common understanding of what we're supposed to be doing, and I, uh, I exhort you. This word exhort is a really powerful, powerful word. Uh, it, it means, it is very uh, minimum meaning, it means to call alongside. It's, a, it's a, a term that's used of the Holy Spirit, the one who is called alongside us. The paraclete is the, the Greek word for that. Uh, he's calling them alongside us it's a word with the fullness of meaning. It covers persuasion, entreaty, admonition, consolation. And one, uh, the, the popular commentary of the Bible says there's no single English word that can reproduce everything that this word means. It has alternative uses just to help you understand. In 1 Peter 2.11 we see, we see the words, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners. The same Greek word, I beg you. In Hebrews 10.25, looking at our responsibility as Christians when we come together in church, we're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. We are here to encourage and to exhort and to admonish if we need to, to each other, to help each other do something. And Peter is exhorting all the pastors, all the elders in the churches to do something very, very important. And he, he notice what he says here. I am one of you and I'm also a witness of the Lord's sufferings. Now, I hope when you read in your Bible and you see one of these apostles or somebody else giving a, a record of an eyewitness experience with Jesus Christ, I hope you will stop for a moment and focus on that and understand what that means. These men, almost all of them, died because they could not deny what they had seen. And when you're talking to someone who denies the veracity of the Holy Scripture, they deny the entire story of the Bible, they deny everything about Jesus Christ, you need to remember in your mind, listen, I have read eyewitness accounts of people who saw him, touched him, listened to him, walked with him, sat down and ate with him. After he was resurrected, they saw him miraculously die. They saw him miraculously arisen. They saw him. And they died because they could not deny what they had seen. The Bible is true because people proved it with their blood, with their lives, how true the Bible is. I saw him, and, and not only have I witnessed that part of his life, I witnessed the glory. You know, Peter was, was there on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was the glory of, of heaven just shone from him. His true eternal glory just blazed out of him. And they saw that. So when Peter writes, I have some authority behind what I'm saying here. I am one of you. I saw him suffer and die. I saw him rise again. I saw his glory descend from heaven or, or shine out from him, his eternal glory. I saw all that stuff. So I have the authority to say what I'm saying. And based on that, I exhort you. I encourage you. I admonish you. I'm reminding you, don't forget to do what? And then he gives the exhortation in verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, 
not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. It, you know, sheep are kind of stinky, smelly things, and, and they're noted for being among the dumbest of all animals. It's, it's ironic. I, uh, I got a thing in one of my pastoral email things I subscribed to, uh, a preacher back in the stage named Greg Lowry. You may have heard of him. He wrote a little article that was published in this preacher, Preaching Today newsletter, Why Are We Sheep? And his only reason is because we're all just as dumb as sheep. <laughs> that was his whole, the whole theme of this one little paragraph that they put in, in the newsletter. And he, he talks about you take almost any other animal out in the wilderness and turn it loose, it'll find a way to survive. You know, all over the United States, domestic hogs have been let run wild, and now they're out there just tearing up the entire southeast United States. They, they learn how to survive, any, almost any other animal. When you turn a bunch of sheep loose out there, they won't live very long because they just can't make it on their own. And Greg Laurie's thing was, we're sheep because we're just about as dumb as they are. We need a shepherd. Sheep, the, the little four-legged woolly kind need a sheep, and you and I need a shepherd. And, and, and Peter is acknowledging and He's telling the elders, the shepherds, the under-shepherds, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. You and I need to count it a blessing to be called part of the flock of God, by the way. Do not ever be insulted by that term. We should be blessed by it. They are among you. You're to shepherd them. Now, this shepherd part, uh, it, it has to do, first of all, with feeding, but that's not the end of it. Uh, it I'm going to show you where it's used again. In John 21, 15 through 17, Jesus is talking to Simon Peter. He has, uh, he's been crucified, buried, resurrected. He's walked among them, shown himself to them on several occasions. He's with them uh, not too long before he ascends into heaven. And this conversation takes place in John 21, beginning of verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, G Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. The Greek word there is simply feed them, put them out to pasture. It's, uh, then in verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. And there he used the same Greek word we're looking at in our text for today, shepherd. It means to tend to. It's, it has a lot more to, to, uh, to do with a lot more than just feeding. Take care of all aspects of their lives. Look after them, take good care of them. Then in verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep again. Pastor my sheep. Make sure they're fed. So when Peter writes in, I am one of you, a fellow elder, and I'm writing exhorting you to shepherd the flock that is among you, I do it not only on the authority that I saw Jesus suffer and die and uh, resurrect, I saw him in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, I have it directly from his mouth that our job is to tend to the flock of God. Shepherd those sheep that are entrusted unto you. So he has that exhortation. Do it... Uh, as overseers, there is a responsibility here to watch over the spiritual welfare of the flock of God and, and also the material needs as far as, as we're allowed to do so by the provisions that God makes for us. We're to oversee, make sure that everyone is doing well in, in their life and, and, and getting along well. Uh, we're to do it not by compulsion, not because we're commanded to do so, but we do it willingly. I would feel sorry for any group of people sitting in a church who has a man standing in front of him who thinks he just has got to be there because he can't be anywhere else. This is his commandment. He hates it, but he's been told to do it, and he's doing it, and he doesn't really love what he's doing. That's not the kind of man you want serving you <laughs> in church. And you as a church, you're going to be looking for a new pastor here not too long down the road, so understand that. You need somebody who does it uh, willingly, loves what he's doing, and will do it enthusiastically, uh, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Money is not the motivation for people to go into ministry. I hope you understand that. People go into the ministry because there's a call and there's a delight in answering God's call and there's a joy in serving Him in this way. So that's the exhortation. And then in verse 3, He gives limitations. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Beware the pastors who try to exert political and judicial authority over every aspect of your life. Be, beware of the legalists who try to say, it's my way or the highway. We're not to be lords over you. We have a Lord, and one Lord's all you need. You have a great shepherd. We are under shepherds, and under his authority, we function among you. 
And we have to always keep that in mind. The Lord Jesus never forced himself upon anybody and no pastor in any church should ever try to force his views on people. Uh, we speak from the word of God. You take it or leave it as you see fit. But we'll tell you what we think the word of God says. You have a choice whether or not you believe it. But we're not to be lords over you. We don't have that kind of authority. We can't be banging you around in the pulpit and trying to force you to do things our way. We're to be examples to you. Now notice the term here, entrusted to you. Entrusted to you. There is a stewardship responsibility when a man assumes the pastor of a church. There's a stewardship responsibility. God is putting a part of his earthly flock in the hands of that man to lead them, to feed them, to tend them, to, to make sure that they get the good things that God has for us. It, it was made very clear back in Acts 20, 28 when Paul is meeting for the last time with the leaders of the church in Ephesus. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You do not belong to us. Our blood did not purchase you. His blood purchased you. You're part of his flock. He's taken us as under shepherds, put us in a place where we have this responsibility toward you during this period of time. But he is the owner. You are our trust. And we have that stewardship responsibility. <clears throat> when David... You know, all those heroic stories about him as uh, out there you know, killing bears and lions with his bare hands. He was not doing that to defend his own sheep. Those sheep didn't belong to David. They belonged to his father. <laughs> when we come into church, you do not belong to us. You belong to my father. I'm to do everything I can to defend you, pr protect you, to feed you and tend to your needs because you belong to my father whom I love and whom I want to honor and whom I obey. So those are the limitations. <laughs> Then in verse 4, there are the expectations. When the chief shepherd appears, that's our over-shepherd. That's the one we work for. Uh, again, uh, be very careful, church. The pastor doesn't work for you. <laughs> he works for the chief shepherd. He's the under-shepherd working for the chief shepherd. We work for the Lord Jesus, but we work among you. Uh, this is important. Back in the States, many, many churches think, you know, we've got ourselves a hired gun in the pulpit. Now let's sit back and watch him run. You know, that's not good. They think the pastor is their hired hand. That's not the way it is. Not supposed to be that way at all. We work for, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ among you, and he has asked for us a crown of glory that does not fade away. There are expectations for the man who does this job well. There is a burden in the heart of the great shepherd for the input. What goes into your system, it has to be pure, unadulterated word of God, fueled by the Holy Spirit of God. It has to have a, a place in your life. Then we move on here and we look at the burden of the good shepherd for our outlook Input, outlook, that's your second word. In these, past, these verses here, the great shepherd cares that you come to the table with an active appetite. <laughs> if we're to feed you, you're supposed to come hungry, wanting to be fed. Uh, with an active appetite, respecting those who feed you and all those who dine with you. You'll see this just in a moment. Come in surrender and gratitude, ready to receive and then to share that which is offered unto you here in this place. Look at verse 5. Look out for others. Likewise, you younger people, this is part of your, your outlook when you come to church, Look, looking out for others. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Now, here in this church, this has double meaning, okay? Adele and I are certainly the eldest people in the church. <laughs> we're the, so in that sense, we're your elders. But the, the pastoral, pastoral role here, that's an elder too. It could be somebody as young as you or younger than you. If he has this job, he is still the elder. So you submit yourself to him. Uh, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The attitude with which you and I come to the Lord's table is very, very important as to how we're going to be fed, how we're going to ingest and digest that which he has for us. We come with the wrong attitude, we could just leave with an upset stomach. It may not do us any good at all to sit in the house of God and listen to the things he has for us. It would upset us if we don't have the right attitude. We come submissive. Lord, I'm here. Your book is open before me. My heart is open before you. I want you to do your will in my life today. I, I love you and I love all these people around me. Uh, I'm not here to seek my own way. I'm here to seek your way. I'm not here to get help. I'm here to help. See, a bad attitude exists in a lot of uh, church-going people. They get up on Sunday morning heading for church to see what's in it for them. You know, God never anywhere in his Bible does he say he blesses selfish attitudes. He blesses attitudes that are magnanimous and open and generous toward others. 
So you come, and that, that passage in Hebrews 10, 25, you don't come to church to get something. You come to encourage your fellow believers to strengthen one another in the Lord. You don't come to church just for yourself. You come for others. You have to have this humility. Uh, yesterday morning in the men's meeting downstairs at breakfast, I, I talked about the qualifications for being an ordained servant of the Lord from uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. And one of those things was humility. It, it, it's, it's all about character and Humility has to be a, a, an element of your Christian character. And we kind of mentioned as, as we talked, how on earth can you be forgiven of your sins and saved, have someone do something for you you could never do for yourself, and then you not be humble before them. You, we have to be humble because of what he's done for us. Well, be humble toward others too because you're all in the same boat. <laughs> and, and, and the rapids are, are coming up. It's, it's a tough life. So, so look out for others. Verse 6, look up to God. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. I've got all kinds of little cliches I've formed in my mind over the years based on that one little verse of scripture. One of those is the way up is down. <laughs> you want to be lifted up? Uh, humble yourself and he will exalt you. Uh, you. You never stand as tall as when you kneel the lowest before the Lord. That's, an, that's another one. And, and there are others, but could make, make you sick after a while. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now here's the point about this. There is a place where God wants all his children to go. And I'm talking not so much about heaven. I mean, that's the ultimate. But in your life, there is a goal he has for your life. He wants to lift you up to a place in, in, in the world, in society, in your own home and family. He wants to lift you up to a place where, that you can't get to by yourself. There are no ladders tall enough. There are no cranes that can reach high enough. No airplanes can fly high enough. Only the Lord can raise you up to this place where he wants you to be. You can't get there on your own. If pride is in your way, that's a load that the Lord will not lift. Can I say that to you? If, you're, if your soul is burdened with pride, the Lord cannot lift that load. He will not. You lay the pride aside, you humble yourself, then he will lift you up. He will put you in a place you can't go on your own. And we all need to be there. We all want to be there. So look up to God. Look out for others. Look up to God. And verse uh, 7, let God look out for you, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Oh, my goodness. I've had sad moments in my years in ministry dealing with Christian people who were carrying burdens that the Lord Jesus wanted to carry for them. They just could not turn them loose. Casting all your cares. I like that little A-L-L. -L. I like to tell people it's kind of like a spider web. Nothing can get through it. You just can't, you're, you're, we're all in there somewhere. And every care of our lives is somehow encapsulated in that little three-letter word, all. All your cares, the big ones, the little ones, the medium-sized ones the ones that just sneak up on you, the ones you've been carrying for decades perhaps, give them all to Jesus because he cares for you. And here's where that humble yourself under his mighty hand comes into it. I tell people all the time, it is a Christian thing to have concern in our hearts, to have compassion. Jesus had compassion. It is a sin to worry about stuff. Because when you and I insist on worrying about stuff, we're saying, Lord, I don't think you can handle this. I'm going to strain and strain and try to help you the best I can. That's pride. That's not humility. Humility says, Lord, I got something bearing down on me I cannot deal with. I can't push it off me. Please take it. And he will lift it up. I love to tell Christians no Christian is ever required to live under any kind of circumstances. Every Christian is already ordained to live above all the circumstances of life. That doesn't mean circumstances aren't going to come. They're going to come. But you can't fight these battles alone. I had the sorry misfortune of being awake at a very inopportune time this morning. I, you get to a certain age where sleep comes in intervals. And I'm that way. And I'll go to bed and I'll go to sleep. And interval number one comes. I wake up. And if I go back and lay down, I'll, you know, sermons start running through my head. I get all this stuff. So I can't fall asleep. I move to the couch, turn on the TV, find whatever sporting events there, and usually in a matter of about five minutes, I'm sound asleep again until the next interval, <laughs> and, and sometimes I get two or three a night. I was on the couch this morning. I, last time I remember falling asleep, there was a basketball game on. When my next interval woke up, it was 
UFC? Mix my well, if you've been watching AFN, you've been seeing the publicity about this big fight between these two undefeated women was coming up on, well, that happened to be right there in front of me. I, I don't watch that stuff, but I've been seeing all this hype, and okay, let's just see what happens. These two women, one of them is the champion. She's never been defeated. Her challenger has never been defeated. She's the only person alive who can possibly defeat her, and all this hype is, so I'm going to watch. And here they come into the ring, these big, bold people, 135 pounds, whatever. And they're going to wage war with each other. And man, the fight starts. And Challenger charges across that ring, just all bold. And I mean, she's a tough lady. The champion intercepts her. They fall to the floor. Within 14 seconds, the challenger had the, the champion had the challenger tapping on the floor for surrender. Let me out of here. All her training, all her pride, all her ego was worth nothing. She faced a formidable foe. They called the champion uh, Ronda Rousey, the most lethal, unarmed woman on earth. <laughs> but she humbled this, this other woman in, in, in 14 seconds, just that quick. You and I face an enemy that can do the same thing to us. We can't deal with the devil on our own. And we can't deal with all the burdens, all the cares, all the concerns that come into our lives. The devil loves to get us thinking about our own problems. Because if we're thinking about our problems, we can't think about anyone else's. He's got us right where he wants us. We can't do anything positive in, his king, in, in the kingdom of the Lord. So, cast all your care upon him. You may want to write this down. I'm really proud of it. I made it up, and I, I like it. I, our best outlook is when we know and trust the one who is looking out for us. That's the best outlook you'll ever have, the best attitude, the best Hope for the future. Uh, point number three, and I'm going to try to hurry. The burden of the good shepherd for, your, for our output. We're going to look at verses eight, nine and, uh, 8 and 9 here just for a moment. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Assume you go to church, you hear God's word, you leave church, you're, you're, you got your warm fuzzy for the week, and, but you go back out in the world and you just kind of fall into the pattern of the world. Everybody's being frivolous and silly and having a good time and not, don't have a serious thought about anything. And so you just stop having any serious thoughts. You just kind of fall into the pattern of the people around you and you start living and thinking and talking and acting like they do. You're not being sober. You're not being vigilant. There's this lion walking around seeking to devour you. Uh, here's, here's what I, the, for the verse number eight, I just talk about your attitude before the adversary. Do know you have a mortal, mortal, supernatural enemy who wants to destroy all the good in your life, take away every blessing God has for you. He wants to bring you down to his level. And even though you're a born-again child of God and he knows he can never again possess you, he wants to mess with your life. He does not want you reflecting the grace and the glory of God to the world around you. He wants to bring you down where you're just as caught up in your problem, just as troubled, just as worried, just as consumed as everybody else around you so nobody can ever see Jesus living in you. When he gets you to that place, he has won a battle. He can't win the war, but he can win that battle whereby you will never have anything positive to do in, in your service to the Lord. The devil walks about like a roaring lion. There are people who even dispute the existence of a devil. Well, Jesus doesn't dispute it. He doesn't want us disputing it. You better believe the devil is just as real as our Lord and Savior is. He is your enemy. Oh, he won't present himself that way. He will present himself as your good buddy, your big favorite friend, or whatever that little letter stands. He wants you to think he's your pal. Got some fun stuff for you to do. Just come on, let's go have a good time. He's your mortal enemy. The day you fall completely, he'll be laughing his head off. You have to have that attitude of sobriety and vigilance. And then your action toward the adversary, verse 9, resist him. Now that's a military word. That's a tough word. That's a fight back with everything you got. The Lord, as he watches us undergoing these challenges, he's, he's, he's seen the input. He, he knows about our outlook. Now, what's our output going to be? Are we going to, is, is it fight or flight? He doesn't really want us running from the devil. He wants us to take him on head to head and defeat him. Uh, you know, if you read it in Matthew uh, 16 where the, the, the Lord told Peter, uh, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
He's not talking about people running in fear. He's talking about people who are on the offensive, on the attack. So when the devil comes near you, don't turn tail and run. Look him, just like the song said, look him in the face. We just got this good song, Willie. Face to face. I'm going to beat you, dude, because I got Jesus on my side. The battle is the Lord's. David didn't run from Goliath. He said the battle is the Lord's, and then he stoned him to death. Look the devil in the eye. Resist him vigorously, energetically, with all your passion and all your power. Devil, you can't beat me because I got someone living inside me who's better than you are. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, the Bible tells us. You're to resist him. Steadfast in the faith. Steadfast in the faith. If you have a wavering faith, you're going to get beaten. You're going to lose. But if you're steadfast, if you're strong in the faith, you are going to win. The last part of verse 9 says, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You don't have to read very far in the news day by day to realize you and I have brothers and sisters in Christ who are being slaughtered on a daily basis for their faith in Jesus Christ. And every time you and I read one of those things, we have to ask ourselves, how would I do under such a trial? Would I be able to stand steadfast in my faith and resist the devil? Or would I turn my tail and run? Would I recant my faith? Would I say anything they want me to say just to save my own life or to avoid the pain? I had a chance this week to ask myself that question several times. I had a very nasty cyst removed from my back on Wednesday, and during the week, Adele has been required to repack that thing. Nasty work. But I lay there on the bed, two hands full of covers, and gritting my teeth, and she's back there pulling the old stuff out. And, put, and I'm laying there experiencing this pain, and I just went, yeah. And I lay there, and I God, this is a minor thing, and it hurts so badly. And, and I, I told her the day before yesterday, I think it was, you know, when people are being punished for their faith and, and suffering, how do they stay strong? It hurts. And this is just small stuff compared to what they go through. And I, I had a challenge. I don't know how much I can take, you know. But standing steadfast in your faith, our output has got to be uh, an attitude of resistance, of firm faith, faith that will not fail. We're going to, I was watching. Discovery Channel, that's one of my favorite things. You know, they have these big, huge water buffalo there, among the most horrible, meanest creatures in the world. But lions like to attack herds of buffalo. When the buffalo turn their heads toward the lions, the lions back up. When the buffalo charge the lions, the lions run. But the minute the buffalo turn tail and start running, here come the lions, right up on their back, and next thing you know, they got a lion down and killed. Don't turn your back on the devil. Stare him in the eye and say, listen, me and Jesus are going to take you on, dude, and you lose. You, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll notice that every time you see Jesus and Satan and one of his little demonic spirits show up in the same place, the devil has to get out of town. They just can't stay where Jesus is. Don't go into the fight alone. Take Jesus with you. You can't lose. The last thing. The burden of the good shepherd for our outcome. He's concerned about our input, our outlook, look, our output, and then the outcome, the net result of our lives as Christians. He has a burden for that. And Peter expresses it beautifully here. May the God of all grace, again, that word all, there is no grace outside of the grace of God. All grace belongs to him. The God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. The outcome of our life is very, very beautiful, folks. The God of all grace. He knows he left us in a world that is plagued by sin. He knows you and I still have that old sin uh, habit hanging around as, as children of Adam and Eve. Even, even though we're forgiven, we still, have, we still live in a, a, a corrupt, sinful body that wants to do all kinds of sinful things. He knows about the struggles. He knows the challenges. He knows about all the dangers. He knows about the times we're going to get hurt. He knows there's going to be suffering as part of it. He said that's part of it. He, he never promised you being a Christian was tripping down a primrose pass and, and cakewalks, that, that kind of thing. It's, it's a tough struggle. He knows about that. But he has called us not just to a life of suffering, but to eternal glory, his eternal glory. And that call came in the Lord Jesus Christ. No other way will that call ever come to you. It comes in the Lord Jesus Christ. After we have put up with whatever we have to put up with, there's a great outcome awaiting us. 
He's going to perfect us, complete us, make us absolutely perfect, establish us, strengthen us, settle us. He's going to bring us into heaven to be with him forever. The result, that's the result that the great shepherd wants for us. And in verse 11, the result the great shepherd wants from us. Don't miss this one because everything I've said so far comes down to this. To him, who's that? The great shepherd. To him be the glory, the dominion forever and ever. Amen. As you and I are struggling through life, we're to live in a way that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to get glory in everything we do. Every time a challenge comes, every time a temptation, every time a trial, every time a heartache comes, let's look at it and say, now, what is there about this that can help me bring glory to the Lord Jesus? There's got to be something here or this wouldn't be happening to me. He wants glory out of it somehow or another. So how can I get that? And if you make that your goal, all these other things will just fall in place for you. To him be the glory and the dominion. He's Lord forever or he's Lord never. His dominion in your life is eternal. Don't ever forget that. You belong to him. Uh, he is yours. Yes, the Bible says he is yours, but he also says many times you are his and he can cares about you. He has a burden for you, for your life, for the quality of your life, for the victory in your life. He wants the best things in the world for you, and he's prepared a way for you to have those things. I don't know about you. I get great encouragement from looking in the Bible and seeing that God did not just care for me to the moment I got saved. Now I belong to him. I am a prized possession. I was purchased with the most unthinkable price you can ever imagine the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ now he is burdened about my life day by day hour by hour the quality of my life he has that burden he wants us to take in good stuff develop a right attitude a right outlook produce the right kind of things in our dealing with the devil and all the sinful world around us and then look forward to that blessed eternal outcome he has for us the glory of the Lord and his dominion in our lives forever and ever. God loves you. He loves me. And I, when, when people ask me, is there anything in the Bible you don't believe? I say, well, the hardest thing is that, uh, that God loves me. That's the toughest thing I can find in the Bible. But I believe it because God said it, okay? <laughs> God loves us. He has a burden for the quality of our lives, for, the, for, for us to have a wonderful, abundant life, as Jesus said in John 10, 10. You and I need to understand that. We need to put ourselves in a position where the Lord who cares so much can do all he wants to do for us and give us that blessed life that only he can give. Father in heaven, the preaching is over. Forgive the ineptitude of it. Work, Lord, through the words on your printed page to touch the hearts and lives of your children today. Lord, we are sheep. You are the great shepherd. The under shepherds have a responsibility, but you're the one who produces all the blessings, all the good in our lives comes for you. And we thank you for that. Thank you that you love us, that you care for us, that you have a burden for us as we go through this troublesome life. Lord, just help us to surrender ourselves to you, to receive all you have for us. And let us, Lord, always give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for every good thing that comes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing our hymn of invitation, we'd like you to consider, first of all, am I part of that flock of God? Have I repented of my sins and turned to Jesus Christ in faith and trusted him to take away my sins, write my name in the Lamb's book of life, make me a child of God forever and ever? Have I done that? You will, if you've done it, you will know. It, it's, a, it's, it's not a process. It's an episode. It happens at a moment in time when you surrender. You make that decision and you surrender to the, to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and let him forgive you and save you. If you have that memory of that, hallelujah. If you don't, please consider, Lord, what would you have me do right now? I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I can't go to heaven the way I am. That's not what you want from me. You want me there with you. What do I need to do? He'll tell you. Then you do it. You may want to just come as a born-again Christian, kneel here and pray to sort out some quirk in your life, somewhere things have gone wrong because you didn't manage them correctly or something. You just want to repent and say, Lord, lift me up and let me do it better when I walk out of this building. Whatever's on your heart and mind, we'd love to talk to you about church membership. Please come. I'll take prayer requests from you. If you have special prayer requests, you can come and share those. I just want you to stand right now and uh, sing the song and listen to the voice of God the Holy Spirit as he speaks to you. Do what he tells you to do. We're here to help you accomplish his will. Amen.
First time I heard those words, I saw that thing about a, like a flood is mercy around. That's the dumbest bunch of words ever written in Christian lyrics anywhere. And then I went down to Venice one week after it had been flooded the week before, and I realized something. That's, it's brilliant. When the flood waters come, nothing, nothing escapes. That water goes everywhere and touches everything. And that's the way the mercy of the Lord is. That's a hallelujah moment when I realized that. Right now, you're going to have a song to sing as you get ready to leave. Put a smile on your face, a song in your heart. Go out rejoicing. Tell people how great the love of Jesus is. Church council members, straight downstairs. Let's have a quick meeting. Get out of here so I can go back to bed. Uh, uh, thank you so much for being in the house of the Lord today. We hope to see you again next week. Uh, married couple Sunday school class down to the fellowship hall next Sunday. When you get here, you'll scatter out from there. No telling. I don't know what he's going to do to you, but just come find out. It's a great adventure. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Call us this week if you need us. We're going to sing that song we taught you at the beginning of the, uh, of the service today, the Advance on the Gates. Advance on the Gates. So be not afraid. There's nothing to fear from my enemy. Discouragement flies as our praises rise. I lift up a shout of victory. With our hands Into his presence, but into it with our eyes focused in on the one without sin. A high power comes as we worship him. Our power, our power comes as we worship one more time. A high power comes as we worship him. Advance on the game. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you next Sunday, everybody. Advance on the gates, but be not afraid. There's nothing to fear from my enemy. Discouragement flies as our praises rise. I lift up a shout of victory. With our hands lifted high, face to the way, a hit to his presence. Into it with our eyes understand on the one without sin. How power.